evening for our last session already. It's been another busy week. We had our election, of course, on uh, Monday, electing a minority government, uh, for which I'm happy. Uh, and we just hope and pray that our government will act on certainly the uh, climate issue. So far, it doesn't sound so promising with the Trans Canada Pipeline now, or the Trans uh, Mountain Pipeline, uh, through those saying that we still want to go ahead with that. Uh, that would not be wise in my opinion. So, uh, I'd like to just sort of go over some of the things that we've been talking about to summarize uh, some of the discussions we've had and to sort of move forward from there. So here are some of the graphs I showed in the first session. Our energy consumption has been escalating significantly since uh, the Second World War, particularly in the area of fossil fuels. This whole section here, the three, of, the three middle ones are the increase in oil use. That's the world energy consumption. This is the per capita consumption, which has also been increasing steadily, except for leveling off a little bit here, but now again we see that it's on the increase, the wrong direction. This is the actual level of carbon dioxide that has been measured at the Mauna Loa station in Hawaii. The carbon dioxide level has increased about 45% since the Industrial Revolution began in the 1700s. Uh, we are currently at around 410 parts per million and increasing, as you can see from this curve, increasing rather uh, steeply. And this is a long-term study, so the data that we see here is obtained from different sources, ice cores being one of them, and we see that the carbon dioxide level has been pretty much constant for the last thousand years, except since about the 1800s when we see the sharp increase. And that's the concern. The greenhouse gases that are responsible then for absorbing some of the Earth's energy are primarily carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and the freons used primarily in uh, cooling equipment. And you notice that the first three, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane, are also on the increase. And this is a shorter time period from about 1980 roughly to the present. So we see again a steady increase in these greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, uh, is of course from fossil fuels. Nitrous oxide is often a byproduct of combustion or degradation of nitrogen fertilizers that farmers use. Those are probably the two main sources. And then methane is often associated with fossil fuels. It itself is a fossil fuel. And one of the sources is from leaks. Uh, as we do our fracking and as we drill for oil, some of the methane can leak out into the atmosphere, uh, but it can also come from agricultural practices, particularly the growing of rice, where you get uh, anaerobic decomposition of organic matter in the rice paddies, and also from livestock, particularly um, some of our cattle, uh, which also emit, uh, emit uh, methane gas. And then here we have the freons. The first two at the top here are the fluorofluorocarbons used in the older air conditioners. They were banned in 1989 through the Montreal Protocol um, to be replaced by hydrofluorofluorocarbon, which has also been banned now and is on the decrease. And the hydrofluorocarbons, no fluorine at all and they are steadily increasing. Those two are very powerful greenhouse gases, even though the concentrations are low, they have 
about a thousand times more ability, anywhere from a thousand to ten thousand times greater ability to absorb energy being emitted from the Earth and warming up the climate there or the atmosphere. Next. So we looked at some of the impacts of climate change in the uh, second session, uh, where we have a warmer atmosphere resulting then from more energy being absorbed, and that also leads to warmer oceans, which in then turn leads to more intense uh, storms, both higher winds, we talked about that process, as well as more water in the air. And so we hear about extreme flooding. We hear about uh, Category 5 hurricanes that used to be very uncommon and now are very common. Just again this week, uh, Tokyo or Japan had some very serious flooding, as they did the week before. Uh, so they've had some very serious uh, flooding in their country. Monsoon rains are also unpredictable, making it very difficult for many of the farmers in Africa and India to know when to plant their crops. And the Bangladesh series that uh, Cindy referred to also talks about that issue, the fact that the monsoons are no longer predictable. And when they do come, they often give way too much water. Uh, causing the seas to wash away. Coral reefs are affected. The Great, the great Barrier Reef of uh, Australia is almost 50% destroyed. Uh, and coral reefs around the world are facing pressure. We saw that the vast majority of glaciers around the world are melting. And that this past summer, Greenland had some some of the most ice melt in its uh, recent history. The permafrost is uh, falling, leading to instability in the Arctic communities and affecting the uh, native activities in those areas. We find more intense wildfires. Again, if you've been watching the news at all recently, California is on fire because of the excessive droughts that they had, and they had to shut down the electrical system because of the concern for sparking, which could ignite more fires. And so a large segment of that population, that state, is being affected by the recent fires and uh, loss of electricity. We find the spread of tropical diseases such as um, malaria spreading throughout the world. Um, the West Nile virus is now common in our area. We're finding other diseases like that. And the production of crops is affected. For every degree rise in temperature, the crop yield goes down about 10%. And so those are also effects that we're experiencing and will have dramatic effects in the future. Third talk, we talked about the controversy associated with climate change and why, even though the science has been very clear since the 1900s, or even the late 1800s, um, we still find so much discussion about it. Um, some of you probably have watched the a uh, video that I recommended, Shell's uh, Climate of Concern, put out in 1991, giving a really pretty good summary of what global warming, as it was known at that time, was all about. After the Earth Summit in Brazil in 1992, we had the um, campaign of misinformation by the oil companies um, to confuse the public about the signs of climate change. If you say something often enough, you can begin to believe it. And so, by getting other so-called scientists to speak on their behalf, uh, 
they were able to convince the general population that the science was really not that well understood yet, and therefore we should not worry. It was primarily to protect the interests of the fossil fuel industry. The Koch brothers were uh, leading financiers for this movement. And as a result, uh, we still find many people, including fellow Christians, who deny that humans can have an impact on our great world. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that we must keep the temperature increase below 1.5 degrees on the moon. In order to achieve that, we have to have drastic cuts in our greenhouse gas emissions. And as we hear reports from various scientists around the world, we hear them say that the impacts are actually occurring faster than what we have planned on, or what we have thought would happen. And then we also look then at our economic system. What is it about our economic system that allows this kind of thing to happen? And so the economic system is a linear system in which we take our raw materials, convert it into various products, and dispose of that in our garbage dumps, basically. We don't really recycle the resources within uh, the creation very much. It certainly is not set up the way nature is designed to work, where we have no waste. There is no waste in creation. Everything gets reused by the various organisms that God put into creation at the beginning of time. Our economy is based on continued growth of our gross domestic product. And if it falls below 1%, we're in trouble. If it goes zero, oh man, that's a disaster. A recession is going, is going to start. But within creation, again, if you have uncontrolled, continuous growth, that leads to the death of an organism, such as in old person cancer. If cancer continues to grow in a person's body, you simply cannot live. And we see that happening with our economic system then as well. We see that our system is failing the world, it's failing the poor people, it's failing so many people throughout the world, not just within our own country, but it's failing people in Africa and in China and elsewhere. And why is this? Well, it's partly because of the extreme capitalism that we have now. Capitalism itself is a good economic system and it motivates people. But when you have the extreme with no controls, no regulations, then it's almost like a dog eat dog world and whoever can bite the best can get the richest. And so, uh, we have a wide disparity between the rich and the poor, and that is growing ever wider, which is leading to unrest in many countries. We've seen that un unrest in France with the Yellow Jacket movement. We've seen the unrest in the U.S. with the 1% uh, movement. Uh, so we, we, we see glimmers of this unrest throughout the world. And so we need another economic model. And so I introduced the donut economy uh, from Kate Raworth. And uh, just to look at that again, in which she says there are limits, outer limits to our society and inner limits to the society. The outer limits are, in a sense, the creational limitations or the ecological limitations or boundaries, you can use different terms, 
And if you exceed those, as we see in some areas here, like climate change or um, biodiversity, when we exceed those, it causes problems. We have to live within the boundary in each of these different areas. And similarly, at the inner level, she has that these social issues, such as adequate housing, food supply, education, uh, justice, all those social issues. And if they fall in the cracks, as many people do here, again, there is injustice occurring. And Kate Robert basically argues that we have to have people and humanity living within those two boundaries, the outer boundary and the inner boundary. And so she pictures it as a dolphin. One which is, it kind of visualizes it rather nicely. Uh, don't take it literally, of course. Uh, but it's the, it's the boundaries, and those boundaries are quite flexible. But when we exceed them, then we find a breakdown either in the creation itself or in our social structures. So what can we do about the climate uh, crisis? Uh, we talked briefly about the Green New Deal. And you'll be hearing a lot more about this. In fact, some of the young people that were marching Friday in Vancouver, uh, with Greta Thunberg, talked about the Green New Deal, urging politicians to adopt the Green New Deal in Canada as well. It's a way of trying to restructure our whole society almost at once, because the problem is so big. It's a huge problem that we're dealing with. We're trying to change the way our economic system works. And so rather than fixing one area, the Green New Deal says we're going to have to tackle multi areas simultaneously to address all of these problems uh, with a new vision for what the world should be. And that includes then um, restructuring the economy to a more circular economy that is in harmony with creation, whereby we do not create waste that the creation cannot handle. But we have to set up, we have to have an economy that is such that the resources that we take out of creation can be continually recycled. And so we have to make sure that what we make can be reused which means that we have to rethink how we do certain activities. How do we manufacture chemicals in such a way that those chemicals will not harm the creation? How do we do uh, our business? How do we run our business operations? Corporations within that system also need to have less power and we need to have more community ownership of uh, our own decisions. So rather than having the uh, corporate corporations take over our public utilities, as we have under some of our free trade agreements, we need to ensure that communities retain ownership of those very important resources that need to benefit all of our citizens. We must eliminate fossil fuels by, or maybe not eliminate fossil fuels themselves, we need to eliminate the use of fossil fuels. I think that would probably be a little better to phrase it than, we don't want to get rid of fossil fuels, we don't leave them in the ground. Um, so we, we have to ensure that we have a way in which we can do that in such a way that people aren't going to suffer as we make that transition. So that has to be, justice has to be always a big component of whatever we do as we make the transition away 
from fossil fuels to sustainable forms of energy. And there are basically two approaches that we can take. We need to use less energy overall. Because if we just keep on using more and more energy, we're like that economic system that depends on growth. We have to learn to use no more energy than what's available to us in the form of sustainable forms of energy. So that we can also then increase our sustainable forms of energy without at the same time uh, increasing the demand overall for energy. Because if we continue to demand more energy, we can't provide it in sustainable forms. It simply will not work. So we have to learn to use less. So conservation has to be a very important part of that, as well as using things in a more efficient way. And we sometimes have to look at alternate ways of doing things. Can we make carpets in a different way that is more sustainable? Can we, you know, and you can put in whatever you want, can we do things in a different way that uses resources wisely and uh, can be done with sustainable, with sustainability in mind? That requires some very creative thinking. We need young people with a vision to be able to look at that in different ways. And to say, well, just because we've done it this way doesn't mean we have to continue doing it this way. Your way didn't really work all that great. It left us with a lot of problems. And young people are starting to at least raise the issue, uh, but they're also looking for us yet to encourage them and to sort of guide them in terms of what they can do. And then we also need to transition to sustainable forms of energy. And some of the main ones here are hydroelectric, uh, wind energy, solar energy, biofuels. And as just one example, on the radio I heard this week that the city of Toronto, as a company, that wants to take all organic waste, uh, doesn't matter where it comes from, as long as it's organic and biodegradable, they will take that and put it basically in a digester. And they will use the bacteria under anaerobic conditions, that's without oxygen, to break down that organic matter and produce methane gas as a byproduct. Uh, some farmers already do, do that with their manure systems. They produce their own natural gas. That methane that they produce is exactly the same as the methane you get out of the ground. So chemically, it's the same. It's just that it's being produced from a, uh, a biological process rather than uh, from the ground. Uh, this uh, slide shows some of the growth in the renewable uh, energy worldwide. This is from 2007 and 2017. It's hard to get right up to date information on this, but you can see the trend that there's been a steady increase in the uh, use of fossil fuel, of, of uh, sustainable fuels. Uh, hydropower, wind power, solar, biopower, that's the type of stuff that comes in from digesting organic matter, and uh, uh, power from oceans with various forms of getting power from the waves. Uh, next. Just to uh, have a look at the potential of solar, for example. It's estimated that this is the amount of solar energy that reaches the Earth every day. A huge amount of energy. This is how much we're currently using uh, in the form of solar energy for our electricity needs. And if we were to convert or have, consider our use of electricity, this would be how much we actually use per day worldwide in terms of electricity. 
You can see there's a huge space in here where we could add more solar panels and convert more of the sun's energy into electricity. So the potential is there for a tremendous growth in solar, and last week we saw some of that growth taking place in uh, a 2,000 megawatt solar plant in India, where they're producing a, a huge amount of, electric, of electricity. I think it would be better if we distribute those panels within villages and on people's homes, so that we don't have to transmit the electricity anywhere. Uh, but we tend to want to do things on a big scale, by the way, when we make conversions. Uh, you do have the economic advantage of uh, lower cost, but at the same time, there's also a cost associated with doing it on a large scale. It takes up valuable land, and uh, we do have our, our, our parking lots and our roofs on buildings and our homes, and we could put, so we begin by putting solar panels on many roads. This coming December, we have uh, COP25, which is the, uh, the uh, coalition of the parties. This is from the United Nations. Uh, they will be, this is really their climate um, a branch. They'll be meeting again in uh, San Diego this time, Chile, December 2 to 13. The theme there is time for action. We've been doing a lot of talking, a lot of promises have been made, and they're saying at this meeting we're going to have to make some tough decisions and say this is what we're going to be doing. We want to do this, and those are our targets, and we're going to stick to them. Um, we're going to have to reduce our emissions not by 30%, which Canada has said, but we have to reduce it by at least 50% by 2030. Uh, at the rate that we're going, as I saw earlier, Canada will not even meet its target of 30% uh, reduction by 2030. Uh, we have to do some pretty drastic things to get our carbon emissions done. Last week uh, we looked at some of the uh, low impact development. Uh, Next one, the video, where uh, we have Graham Hubert come here from uh, Inwell talking about his uh, passive buildings that, he's built, uh, that they're building for Inwell that use roughly 80% less energy for heating and cooling through just simple changes to the way the buildings are built and putting in very good quality windows. The, the uh, energy costs have reduced drastically, 80%. That's without using any special technology. So it's amazing what they've been able to do. And it's primarily done by ensuring that we don't have thermal bridges between the inside of our homes and the outside that conduct the heat away. Very few builders take that into consideration when they build homes. A passive home uh, is designed to minimize that heat transfer between the inside and out, leading them to lower energy costs. Within our own church, we basically have a zero carbon church. We don't use any uh, fossil fuels in the building except for what is used for generating electricity and what is used for bringing our water. So, um, the operation of the building is all electric and then we also have water. Uh, at the time that we built the building, we uh, decided to, as a congregation to go geothermal um, and uh, we installed 12 roof, uh, heat pumps located up in these ceilings, um, in the hallways. You don't see them here. Um, but the ductwork is basically the same as what you have in a conventional building. So we have the ducts along here. Uh, 
but the heat itself comes from the ground. We have no backup system here, so there is no res electric resistance heating or backup fossil fuels. It's all done by heat pump. And the additional cost for the system was roughly sixty to seventy thousand dollars estimated. And uh, we, the congregation voted one hundred percent to make that additional expense. And uh, we then applied also for a grant, and we're able to get the maximum grant of fifty-four thousand dollars at that time in two thousand five. So it was really a no-brainer when uh, we thought of it. Uh, next slide. Here you see some of the pictures. We have roughly seven kilometers of pipe under our parking lot, and that's where we extract our heat from, from the ground. It's, it's about six, six to seven feet underground, uh, right under the parking lot. And uh, it was a bit of a mess when the uh, pipes were laid. We had some, a pretty wet fall when it was done. Uh, but they managed to assemble it all together. And this, these are the pumps that circulate a fluid through those pipes and to each of the heat pumps. So the heat pumps can extract heat from the fluid. The fluid is water and ethanol. Um, and uh, in, the, in the winter time, then when we're heating, we extract heat out of the ground and put it into the building. In the summertime, we take heat out of the building and put it into the ground. Uh, it works very efficiently. And next slide. Uh, this gives you some numbers. I crunched some numbers for 2015. I looked at our energy costs for that particular year and then used a program called Portfolio Manager, which is put out by the US EPA and adapted by the National Energy or the National Energy. Uh, National Research Council um, in Canada for Canadian use. And uh, the site energy use intensity, that's what that stands for, is what we actually use here. The source is what uh, we use, including what um, is involved in generating the electricity. So if you look at only this figure here, uh, for the Canadian Union for worship facilities, it's at 0.86 gigajoules per square meter. We're at 0.26. So roughly one third of a conventional building. And we made no effort at all to build the building uh, in a passive way, like what uh, uh, Cuban was talking about last week. If we had done that, we could probably get that number much, much lower. So the amount of energy that we use here is very significantly less than uh, most commercial buildings. And that's the advantage of geothermal. It's a little bit more costly to initiate or to build up front, but once you have it, the operating costs are much, much less. And that is really the only way that we have to heat and cool our buildings in the future. The units that we have here are over 10 years old now. Newer ones are about 25% more efficient than what we have. And that number continues to go up, the efficiency of these heat pumps. So there's certainly a lot of development that has occurred in that area. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit more about low impact development. And I've asked Kyle Van der Linden, a uh, former student of mine uh, at Redeemer, and Kyle uh, took a degree in environmental science at Redeemer, and was involved after that work. Uh, first, I think you were in uh, Green Roofs. That's right? correct, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, after that, he uh, is now working for the Credit Valley Conservation Authority, where he's Involved low impacts uh, uh, development within that region. And I'm going to let Kyle take it over for a while, and then we'll have a question and answer period as well a little bit later. 
Perfect. Uh, thanks, Henry. Really appreciate um, you having me here to uh, speak to your church. And uh, as, as Henry noted, I was a former student of uh, Redeemer and, and uh, did environmental science and, and history. And so it's great to see. I see some of my former uh, professors here as well, uh, Mr. Boltice, Mr. Van Dyke. I think I forget my English professor's name. You got it right. Apologies. But it's fantastic, and it's exciting to see all the great things that you guys have done with your building. I did not know that you're not using any fossil fuels to heat and um, you know, power your building more or less in terms of its operations. So that's, that's awesome. And uh, it's really inspiring to see how a faith community can come together and, and do some really positive things. In, in a sustainable way. And that's really, um, yeah, what we're all here about is to, to learn about new ideas, to think about things a little bit differently. And that, that, that's kind of what, you know, put me on my path as well, is, is I always enjoyed water when I was a kid. I grew up all across Ontario, but in particular, I spent some time in uh, southwest Ontario, in Tilbury, which is just west of Chatham. And that area is completely flat. And my parents said, oh, it reminds me of Holland because they have lots of drainage ditches. And it was essentially all marshland. So I spent a good time of my childhood. And my dad started a business at that point in time. So it was like, uh, me and my brother would like to call it uh, our Lord of the Flies years because we had no parental supervision. <laughs> <laughs> so we spent a lot of time in these drainage ditches, catching frogs, being out in nature. And that kind of continued out as a lifeguard when I was in high school and um, got into scuba diving during my university years at Redeemer. Um, so that's carried on through into my career and thinking about water. Um, you know, being in Ontario, we're all blessed to have the Great Lakes. You guys obviously have Coots Paradise, Hamilton Harbor, Lake Ontario. Uh, you have Tiffany Creek going right through your property. And uh, I used to walk through this property, actually, going from my house I rented up into Redeemer. Um, but we're, we're all part of a watershed. And a watershed is the area of land that drains into a creek. So we call it a natural response unit. So what we do eventually makes its way into the water. So this whole concept, Henry spoke of low-impact development in terms of energy use. I'm going to talk to you guys tonight in terms of how we're managing our water. So it could be, you know, potable water, so what we drink and what we use to clean our dishes and flush our toilets, etc. Uh, but if I particularly focus in on stormwater management. So I'm going to show you a clip um, that uh, the organization I work for, Credit Valley Conservation, as Henry noted, uh, specifically manages or thinks about managing stormwater because we're all part of the watershed. So I'll let the clip play and then it's about four minutes and it was, it was directed towards high school students. So uh, I'll put it in that context. So currently our water infrastructure is designed using historic climate data. So what that means is we have designed our storm sewers a certain depth based on how much rain we've been getting. And uh, with climate change, we're observing that all the water cannot be contained 
contained in those storm sewers and were getting a lot of uh, overland flooding and all the garbage and gunk like oil and grease that is being conveyed off your impervious surfaces into your ditches gets carried down to our rivers. So as our climate continues to change and we start to see more intense storms that create bigger and bigger risks of urban flooding with stormwater pollution coming out of parking lots and roads and so on, the use of LID becomes ever more important. We need to be able to capture that stormwater and soak as much of it into the ground as possible before it goes into our sewer system and moves into our downstream river areas. Today we're standing at the Credit Valley Conservation's permeable pavement parking lot. And permeable pavement is a low impact development facility. It allows water to infiltrate into the ground versus an asphalt parking, which creates a lot of surface runoff. A rain garden is like something you put your front lawn and it's used to capture the runoff coming from your driveway or your roof and give it a chance to soak into the ground. Whereas the bioswale is treating the runoff as it's moving off of your property down to other parts of your neighborhood or wherever. And it's trying to slow it down and infiltrate it and clean it and polish it before it gets to you. So low impact development facilities are all um, engineered features and they're designed in a way where you have a filter media and you have storage media. The filter media is essentially soils and the storage media consists of like gravel and stones. So we have 11 LID sites in our watershed that we're monitoring and collecting a lot of data on how these facilities can alleviate uh, the stress on our aging stormwater infrastructure, how we have reduced the quantity of runoff and the amount of pollutants that have reached the rivers downstream. The reason why I really care about what I do is because, you know, it's not because it's, it's cool technical work and, oh, we're going to design these engineering media to clean stormwater, but it's because really what we do here helps to protect the environment over there, like the Credit River through the use of LID, can receive clean water slowly over a long period of time instead of being subject to these really rapid pulses of dirty stormwater that wash off of urban areas. What is so amazing about working at the Credit Valley Conservation with Low Impact Development is monitoring innovative uh, stormwater facilities and see what wonderful difference it has to make to our environment. Okay. So that was kind of a quick synopsis of some of the work that uh, Credit Valley Conservation does. So it focuses on uh, <laughs> it focuses on helping municipalities. So uh, I work for, as I mentioned, CBC Credit Valley. Uh, we have the city of Mississauga, uh, Brampton, uh, Orangeville, Caledon. Peel region as a whole, uh, and we, we try to help our municipal partners adapt to climate change. So this, you had mentioned a number of different flood events. Um, I can spout off Burlington. We had a flood event in Burlington in, I believe, 2014. Uh, there was one in Mississauga in 2013, another one when I just started working there in 2009. So it's, it's a lot of municipalities within southern Ontario are experiencing these kind of flash flood events where you get this downburst of intense rain which the infrastructure, uh, so storm sewers, catch basins, cannot handle and uh, more or less leads to uh, flooding that we see uh, within roadways, within uh, you know, water coming across uh, properties, basements being flooded, etc. Um, so it has been a real uh, issue of concern for municipalities and the fact that our infrastructure is not very flexible or adaptive. And that's where myself and my colleagues that we saw in the video come into play, is that we, we helped to uh, build resilient infrastructure to look at the entire landscape. So when you think about a church here, for example, well, you have a parking lot, and I'm excited to hear you have geothermal running underneath your parking lot. But then what's happening to the water that it rains? Where does that water go to? Now I'm assuming it goes to the storm, uh, stormwater pond right, directly beside you guys. Uh, and, but I would note is that there is no reduction of runoff coming from your property. And that's the whole idea behind um, low impact development is to get that water into the ground 
before it goes into a cash basin and then into a storm sewer pipe and then into either a pond or for 75% of the GTA, it just goes directly into a creek. So it's about thinking about our buildings, our cities as a whole, and thinking about how we can do things differently. It's now not just a parking lot, it's, it's a gravel filter, as we saw in, in, in the diagram. It's not a rooftop, it could be a green roof. It's not just a landscape feature, such as a garden in front of the building. Now it can be a rain garden or a bioscale. And that's kind of the beauty of low impact development, or another term gets thrown around is, is green infrastructure. It gives um, places more than one functionality. It's, it's uh, dualistic in its approach, which I think is you get more bang for the buck in the end. So it, it, that's, that's kind of at the heart of what we do, um, is, is, is trying to create resiliency in the infrastructure, trying to address the challenges that we're seeing with weather, changing weather patterns, and, and trying to improve also the quality of life for, for residents because um, access to greenery and, and trees and, and uh, plants, etc., as a whole, um, it, it, it's, uh, it leads to a higher quality of, of, of life. So I guess my, my challenge to the, the congregation is here is let's not stop at energy. Let's think about water as well, what we can do. Is there something that we can do with our landscapes? Um, you know, when you think about your capital budget planning, what can you start to think about, you know, five years down the road, 10 years down the line, and thinking about how we can manage the water on our property as well. So on that note, I'll uh, leave it there. And I'm very aware we have about 20 minutes left, so I just want to let you all know that this section of the evening is actually um, a workshop that is a whole day workshop. I'm not going to keep you here for the rest of the night, don't worry. Um, but it's designed to be a whole day or four separate evenings, so I'm going to jam a bunch of information into the next 20 minutes as well as an activity. But just so you know, I highly recommend taking this postcard, going to the website and downloading the full workshop because there's so much more information there, so much more to supplement to you and help you prepare for doing advocacy. Um, and that's something you can do on your own, something you can do as a part of a group at your church or in your community, or you can even contact us and we'll come and help facilitate that for you. Um, so if you want to go to the fourth slide, so there should be... Oh, okay, sure. There. <laughs> um, so we created this workshop because we had a lot of people coming and talking to us about wanting to speak out, wanting to have their voices heard, wanting to talk to um, their political leaders, whether that is your prime minister, whether that's your MP, your MPP at the provincial level, or your MLA if you're not from Ontario, or even your ward councillors. You know, sometimes you want to talk about something that is really specific to your local community, and it might be someone at the municipal level that you talk to. So we created this workshop because we wanted to equip people with the tools needed to be able to actually go and do that work. Now, whether that's making phone calls, whether that's writing letters, that's social media, or meeting in person. We really emphasize in-person meetings as being really important and valuable. Um, so this workshop, um, is designed to equip you with all the tools to do that step by step. So next slide. Some people ask us why do we do advocacy and why do we call it biblical advocacy? Um, some people think, you know, the church shouldn't be involved in the political sphere. Some people get worried about being too political. Um, and this is probably a bit really small, but I have a bunch of examples there about um, different reasons why we think that advocacy is actually a biblical concept. Um, we look at the example of Esther and Moses speaking up and speaking truth to power. Um, when we understand the concept of shalom, of communities thriving and having enough and working for a just world where structures and institutions give everyone the opportunity to thrive, that is actually what we're working for as part of our Christian communities. And um, finally, we know, we know that charity is important, but we also want to work for long-term change that would mean, hopefully, that we wouldn't have to rely on charity constantly but to actually find change for those unjust and broken systems. So if you have any questions afterwards about you know, why Christians get involved in political activities or why we get involved in advocacy, please come talk to me afterwards. Um, I've got a lot more resources uh, about why I think it is actually a biblical call to do advocacy. So next slide.
Uh, next slide, we're running out of time. So I'm going to give you guys a really short, um, focused in session in the next 10 minutes on how to do advocacy through these awesome postcards um, that we've created to help you share an advocacy message. The workshop itself does training on how to write letters, again, how to prepare for an in-person meeting with your MP, but one of the first steps you can take is really to write a short message um, based on the information that you've learned, either just tonight, if this is your first night here, or over the past six weeks. Um, sharing a message about what is important to you and uh, how you would like your elected leaders to respond to issues such as climate change. So we're going to start with your, your key message. I've broken this down into three specific questions, the three W's. What is your issue? Why do you care? And what can be done about it? So if you can ask yourself those three questions, about whatever issue is important on your heart, what's burning, burning in your mind after hearing Dr. Brower speak, um, or you know, talking about watersheds, or talking about um, infrastructure and buildings and the ways that we put together our communities. Um, whatever that is that you've been thinking about, um, I think for most of us there's probably one thing that stuck out through this whole series of what we really um, think is important and what we want to respond to. So, in asking those three questions, what we're trying to do is help you dial down your issue. Because it's really it's easy to sort of write a letter or walk into your MP's office and say, I want you to care more about climate change. And they'll say, okay, that's very vague and unspecific. Um, can you share more? So, what we try to do is help people dial down your message from the very beginning to get a sense of you know, what is a specific, tangible thing that you can ask for action on? So that's why we broke it down into these three W's. So for example, what is your issue? If I were to say, for me personally, over the series, I have found um, a, a particular interest in renewable energy, especially when it comes to reducing fossil fuels, and especially when it comes to driving. I actually need to replace my car in the next couple months. I drive a car that's about 20 years old. It is well beyond its happy days. And <laughs> it's an adorable Volkswagen bug. It's really cute, but it's gonna die. Um, so my issue, personally, is that I need to have transportation because of, you know, because of the, the circumstances of my life. I need to have a car to get to work, to get to visit my family. And so I'm thinking about the possibility of getting an electric or a hybrid car. So, to me, what's really pressing on me is, why are there so few hybrid and electric cars available? Why is this something that the government is not stepping in and endorsing or helping, you know, in the past there have been um, tax credits you can get or rebates and things like that, not super available right now. So my issue personally might be um, that, that particular thing, wanting to talk to an elected official about increasing access to hybrid and electric vehicles. So I care about that because it directly affects me because I actually have to make a choice about that in the next couple months. And what can be done about that? Well, if you look at the past, we can see that there have been, again, particular tax credits, particular programs available to help people um, access those products a little bit more affordably. So that is just a very quick walking through of one of those issues. Yours might have nothing to do with cars, yours might, yours might have something to do with something entirely different. Um, but I encourage you to just think for, I'm going to use three minutes to think through those three questions and answer them. And as you answer them, write down your answers to that um, in sort of a very shortened letter form on the back of this postcard. So, for example, if you're not, um, you know, if it's not coming right to mind exactly what to say, you can say, dear, well, I'm going to get to that part in a minute, actually, so don't fill out the address part. Um, but say, I am particularly concerned about X issue. I have heard this about it based on what we've learned over those past six weeks. I think this should be done. Sign your name. So I'm going to give you three minutes to do that. Okay. I know some of you probably are deep in thought, but you can finish it um, when you go home, or I know some of you might want to take more time to think about it and work on it a bit later. Um, but I want to move on to the next section just to give you a quick um, 
overview of how to identify your elected official. Um, hands up in the room, do you know who your MP is, who you just voted for, or who you just voted for? Is there anyone who doesn't know how to identify who your MP is? No one's putting up their hands. Well, we'll go through it really quick. If you can just go to the website. Um, if you're ever wondering, um, particularly who the person is that you would want to contact um, in Parliament, there is a website called rcommons.ca where you can actually click, just actually click just to the right there on members, and then the members of Parliament, down one. And if you put in your postal code, so if you put in LHL2A5, which is my postal code, I live downtown, you'll see that the current member is Matthew Green, who was just elected um, last week. And his picture isn't up there yet because it's so new. Um, you can go down to the contact button, down right there, down below. And uh, if you scroll down, you'll actually see all the contact information for the constituency office, which is where you would go to meet with them in person here in the local community, or their office on Parliament Hill, which is actually where we're going to send these. You see that it's actually addressed to that already. That's because in Canada, it's free to send mail to the House of Commons because it's Canada Post, owned by Canada. Um, so it makes it a lot easier to send advocacy messages like this. So if you do know who your MP is, you can put their name in the Dear Matthew Green section or whoever it is. If you don't know, you can come chat with me after and we can make sure we get that filled out for you. Um, I'm going to go back to the slideshow for the next couple minutes. Um, and just talk a little bit about in-person meetings. Um, we think that sending postcards are really helpful, especially when they're ones like this that have similar branding so that they get a bunch of the same organization. Uh, this is the Center for Public Dialogue. And so they can see that there are a lot of people who care about a particular issue or who are speaking out through a particular agency. So we do think postcards are helpful. We don't think they're the most helpful, though. We actually think that in-person meetings are the most helpful. Um, letters are helpful, social media, calling, you know, they all have their different place, um, but we really want to emphasize how important it is to actually go and meet in person with these individuals um, because it actually is their job to hear from you. It's actually their job to represent their constituents and the people who voted for them, or even if you didn't vote for them, they're still, you know, they're still responsible to you. Um, and it's their job to take into consideration what the people in their local community think and care about. So that's why we think it's important for you to speak out. Um, we also think it's important because there's a possibility that you may know more about a particular topic than they do. I would say it's almost a guarantee that Henry Brower knows more about climate science than your local MP does, no matter how brilliant they are. So it's possible that now that you've learned from Dr. Henry for the last six weeks, you might know more about climate science than a particular elected official. And you can take that knowledge and go and talk to them and help convince them, or give them a really convincing argument at least, about a particular issue. So can you go ahead in the slides? Um, keep going, we're not actually gonna... Okay, yes, here. So we really recommend um, that if you go to meet with an elected official, whatever level they are, whether it's your board counselor, whether it's your MP or MPP, that you prepare before you go. It's really important to have a sense of um, how a meeting works, um, but also how to structure it so that you go in with notes, you go in prepared, and you go in with enough knowledge to be able to have a reasonable and credible uh, conversation with them. So first off, we say start off with the good news. Um, introduce yourself and build positive rapport. So by that we mean it's actually really important to build a positive relationship with the individual. Um, there's so many people who go in with only bad news, with nothing good that they can say, with the sense of, you know, there's nothing good you could possibly do. Um, and that just doesn't start off a positive relationship. And it doesn't put them in a position to really want to hear you and um, help push forward your position. So we say start with the good news. Even if you didn't vote for them, even if you don't particularly like them, find something positive to say and build a good rapport with them. And then state your key message. So those three W's that I just said, that's your key message. It, you know, if you were to um, be in an elevator with, 
with a powerful person. If you walked into an elevator with Justin Trudeau and you wanted to be able to rattle off in 30 seconds um, what you think needs to be done to make the world a better place, that's what your key message is. So um, that's something to state right off the bat, make sure that that becomes clearly the purpose of the conversation, the purpose of the meeting, and identify what you are wanting to accomplish. A lot of times when you meet with someone, with an elected official, you have about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, you're lucky if you get half an hour. And you have to assume that for half of that time, they'll be talking. You're only gonna get about half of that meeting in terms of um, opportunity to speak. So you need to be able to be very clear, very succinct, and to have that all laid out before you meet with them. Um, so state your message and identify the problem. Get a very clear, concise, relevant brief of what the issue is. And then pose pertinent questions. You know, offer constructive criticism to, to the issue, um, and also identify some potential adverse effects that there could be to a current policy. You know, there could be a potential adverse effect towards current policy of cutting 50% of the funding for flood management. That is a potentially catastrophic thing to do. And you could point out some um, adverse effects to that if that policy continues. Next slide. And then present your credible solution. So what, what should be done about it? What action do you want them to take? It's important when you're going in to meet with someone, even if you're not an expert, even if you don't have degrees and letters behind your name, that you still come up with some level of suggestion or solution to what you're wanting, wanting to happen. If you go into a meeting again and say, everything's wrong, I hate everything you do, I have nothing positive to say, and I also have no solutions to the issue that I'm wanting to do, again, you're not gonna get very far. Um, so have, have a suggestion, or at least have questions that could lead towards solutions. Ask them why are things this way? What can we do differently? How can we work together? Um, acknowledge opposing views and provide responses. Be aware that it's likely that other people have met with your MP, or your MP has heard criticism, and is fully aware of the opposite perspective to yours. So don't go in ignoring that. Be aware that that is something that could become part of the conversation, that could derail the conversation if you don't actually have, have appropriate responses to that. Um, and come in with all the, all the information at, at hand. Um, make note of your supporters and allies. So think about who supports your position. Do, does the local conservation authority support your position? Does your local denomination support your position? Are there um, people you're affiliated with or groups you're affiliated with who agree with you, who could add clout to your position or could even come with you when you're meeting um, with your elected official? And then finally at the end of your 15 minutes or whatever time you've been given, restate the specific reason for your meeting. Bring the discussion all the way back. If it's been derailed, if the MP's gone off and talked randomly about tax cuts or something, bring the conversation back and um, talk about your key message and ask for a specific response. It's actually really helpful um, not to see that one meeting with your elected official as the final end goal of all of your advocacy, but to see it as actually a continuing conversation. You're gonna to continue to ask for responses, continue to meet with them, continue to communicate with them, and ask them for a particular response. Say, I wanna hear back from you in two weeks, or I wanna know when the budget comes down from the federal government, if there's gonna be funding included for this particular climate care policy, for example. <coughs> so ask for a response and continue that conversation with them. Next slide. Okay, I think we have actually run out of time and I don't want to keep everyone late and I want to leave time for some questions, but I want to remind you yet again, this full workshop can be downloaded and used um, and you can come and chat with me too if you have any questions about it afterwards. But hopefully I've given you just a small taste of some of the advocacy resources that we have available. And if you have filled out one of these, you want to leave it with me, I will put it in a mailbox on the way home. Or you can take it home and put it in the mailbox when it is right and ready for you to do so. So I'm going to pass it back to Henry and I'll run around with the microphone if people have questions. I just wanted to finish with Psalm 148, which is a psalm of praise for all the wonderful things in God's creation. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. 
Praise Him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord. Notice that little let in there. It's almost as give all these things permission to praise the Lord. And when we screw things up, it means that those things are not able to praise the Lord. Let them, um, let them praise the name of the Lord, uh, for at his command they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding. You mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and tiny <coughs> birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and women, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens, and he has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart, and that includes us. Praise the Lord.